dismantling our legacy of racism is still one of the biggest challenges that we face as a society. I'd like to experience a day when we no longer need an Overcoming Racism conference, actually. But that is not this day. The other reason why I'm here is to remind you that our work is not finished. Our work is not finished when most indicators of health, education, community well-being, and racial disparities of all types are so large and persistent. Our work is not finished when allies for, and champions for equity like Sue Hag of the Met Council, are not supported in our community. Our work is not finished when we have so many college students and graduates of color without jobs, even though they're highly qualified when we keep talking about employment disparities. And though it is bittersweet when I listen to leaders that work with me talk about a deficit mentality, with a deficit mentality, about people of color, and I'm in the room, I know that our work is not finished. <laughs> it's not like all of us who are people of color are criminals, low income, or lack the aspirations to pull ourselves up. And yet, I am there, and they forget. And finally, our work is not finished when we're still afraid, as parents of color, that Michael Brown will be our child. And the challenges often come in forms that you can't even anticipate, right? So when I first got married, my husband Lou and I lived in a really rough neighborhood in the, on the east side of St. Paul. Uh, Lou and I are both Hmong, and uh, we were settled as refugees, first-generation college students. We'd overcome a lot of barriers. I grew up in St. Paul. He grew up in a town of 200 people, German Lutherans in Michigan. Coming out of poverty, uh, being homeless, displaced, learning a new language on top of that was really challenging for both of us. Um, so here's the example of the rough neighborhood we lived in. One day, when my husband left his car in the alley, he came out of the apartment to find that poop and urine had been tossed over his Honda Accord. It was normal to find broken windows in our neighborhood because there were so many rocks thrown at our windows. This was a neighborhood that was mostly in transition, becoming low-income white to black to Hmong. We don't even know who hated us. It seemed that even the children in the streets called themselves us names. Like I'd be outside and someone would ride a bike and someone would throw out a racial slur. And one night, my husband um, rushed to aid a neighbor who had been stabbed in the stomach. Um, he was stopping the flow of blood with his hands. His wife had stabbed him because of a domestic situation. She, he had been choking her. And at the time, I was actually giving my son Fuchi, who was six months old, uh, a bath. The struggle seemed endless and unsurmountable to me, even having lived the life that I had lived. And then one day, when I was doing dishes in relative peace, I looked out of the kitchen window and saw something that almost made my heart stop. And the tears started streaming down my face. Can anyone guess what it was? Well, I'll tell you. In the alley behind our apartment building, I saw the backs of two little girls with their skirts fluttering in the wind. One was black and the other was Asian. I think the Asian girl was Hmong. And they were both about seven years old. They were holding hands and keeping each other safe, walking across the shards of broken glass down the long, narrow alley. It was obviously a dangerous path, and each was helping the other get across. Their hands reached out for each other halfway, taking turns. And in that moment, I still, I still tear up when I think about it. In that moment, I saw a flash of the beauty that is the unconditional love and friendship that is present in humankind before we destroy it with our structural inequality and the forces of socialization that work to continuously separate ourselves from our humanity. The future was so present in these girls, this image, almost immediately they erased my pessimism and the growing hatred that had planted itself in my heart. I was able to become more forgiving again and to let my optimism flow back. Here's the thing I've never understood about Americans. We're a country built with displaced people. We have legacies we've inherited from previous generations. 350 years of violence, terror, and horror 
which we have to overcome today. We want transformation, but forget that it was only 50 years ago that women and people of color and those who are disadvantaged gained the full rights of citizenship. And that previous to this, those who were in these categories, if we asserted ourselves, were subjected to violence, death, torture, ignorance, and so many other things. Climbing outside of our social boundaries was reinforced with terror and destitution and so many things until the civil rights movement. So advancing social justice and equity is like that. It can be beautiful, but hard. I really appreciate the opportunity for overcoming racism to gather everyone together, especially community members, which, because those are not people students get to see on a daily basis, so they can get out of their campus and learn about what's really happening today and tomorrow and in the future in the community. And that encourage us to do our job better. Um, you know, I'm optimistic. Uh, being like one of the younger people here, I feel like, you know, I definitely like, yes, like we have to, like we are the youth and we have to um, make this change. And it's really inspiring to see so many people here that are doing this work. Um, and that definitely fuels the desire to say like, yes, like we can keep trying to make things better. We've been able to have uh, excellent feature speakers here and also uh, some, some workshops that really help us get down to the day-to-day -day activity that we can do to overcome racism. Everyone's so scared to talk about race and therefore we sit with the status quo. Nobody will touch that. By opening it up here, we're able to have people of all different races, as we label them, sit in a room and talk with each other about their experiences, their, where they're coming from in their life, and, and what we can do to try and bring ourselves together as the only race, the one human race. Transformation process. Um, so for maybe for um, uh, Leon and for Dr. Johnson, the question that I have for you is, what are the lessons that you've learned along the way in, in your own transformational journey through your institutions or with you that you might share with, um, with the audience that maybe you didn't get a chance to say in the video? So I'll start with Reverend Johnson. Well, there are lots of lessons. I, um, I guess one that I was actually thinking about is uh, in reference to the first question, but relates very much to this question also. Um, and that is the necessity of uh, continuing to find those uh, ways of connecting heart and head. Um, and I, I think Maria's music uh, does that. Um, uh, the stories that we are lifting up, uh, your story, um, I found to be a very powerful story. And it's not surprising that, uh, you know, you told us that it's hard to tell it without feeling emotional. Uh, because, but it's not just the story. It's, it's that story connected to a bigger story. Um, and uh, so um, it seems to me in transformation work, it's always about making that linkage uh, between those you know, personal stories which are so uh, crucial um, uh, for us in terms of motivation and then a bigger picture. Um. I think for me, um, we have the ability to come together. We have the ability to do great things. People inspire me. People inspire me because I see a deep sense of creativity in us. And unfortunately, that creativity sometimes is stamped out very early in our socialization. And the lessons I've learned is when you dig a little deeper, when you create the space, people bring out the best. I've been known to cry when four-year-olds at a daycare center are in a skit and they bring out their creativity, it just brings tears to my eyes. My son was about eight years old, and he was learning to play the trombone, and his arms were not long enough. <laughs> but he was creative, and he played in that school band. And the band didn't sound, you know, as well as it could. <laughs> but those kids were trying. And that's probably why I work in higher education, because people come there to be better, to learn more, to work harder. And I 
just take great joy when I see the end product, when I meet them in the street and they tell me where they're working and what contribution they're making, and I try to attend the award ceremonies when they are honored. That really inspires me, and that is the, some of the lessons that I've learned, is let's show up. Mm. If we look in the room today, who's here and who's not here, I can think of at least 25 people that I wish were here. Mm -hmm. And it makes me uncomfortable that I didn't do enough to make sure those 25 were here today. Let's create the space to be creative and let's create the space to get to know each other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. So um, one, of the, one of the things I reflect on a lot um, at Wilder, but just work in the community is, when transformation is happening, what does it look like? Um, what does it look like? Uh, so, you know, um, one of the things that it looks like to me at the Wilder Foundation is that it's not just uh, people of color who are actually talking about race and racism. And, uh, it's, and uh, that, at least from my view, white people see themselves as a part of eliminating racism, that they're part of the racial equation. What does transformation look like you, for you in terms of cultivating transformation, overcoming racism? What have you seen in the community and what does it look like? What does it feel like too? Um, so why don't we start out at the, at the end, uh, Commissioner Ellinger? When I, when I see the change that's occurring in the narrative about what creates health, I see transformation. Mm. When we start talking about uh, the fact that it's community, it's relationships, it's the power structure, it's policies and systems that really create change, when people start thinking differently about, about what uh, health is in, in my world, that it's not about just about individual choice or about medical care, it's really about the policies and the systems mm -hmm. and the structure and, and the power. Uh, when I see that change in the narrative, that I see as transformational because it transforms who's part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. It also transforms uh, thinking about who has power. So as Leon said, who's in the room, but who's in the room, who's around the decision-making tables, who gets to make the decisions, who sets the agenda, who holds people accountable. That's all part of the narrative that I see changing. And I think that's transformative. And as I go around the state, I, I hear those things, I see those things, and I, I'm really encouraged that the community is ready for that transformational change that began with a change of the narrative. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. I'll do it too. Yeah, I, th I think, um, once again, I, I on my way here this morning, I got a phone call from someone who was um, uh, going into, who is in, in the hospital and at the end of life. And the children have to now make the decision to disconnect, you know, and the, her words were have to pull the plug. And um, she was really struggling with the fact that she could not be with this group of children in her family who had to quote unquote, pull the plug. So f f what, what I saw her, what I heard from her, and what I hear from her relative to the children, is the children were not um, uh, blaming anybody for the death. Uh, the children were not uh, feeling so totally overwhelmed and paralyzed with thinking about death that they were going to uh, be uh, disruptive and chaotic, because we see that often. Uh, but the children were saying, um, he, I will see him again, that he, he's not gone. He is going to be with me as an ancestor. He can continue to direct me and guide me, so I don't have to feel like I'm alone. So transformation is uh, recognizing life at all ends of the cycle and seeing it play out in your decisions, particularly those decisions that have to do with death, because the fear of death seems to really be so pervasive around us because we experience so much. So I see it in the decisions that are made and the way people get together and celebrate life even if death is present. Uh, children are referring to ancestors without feeling like it's some kind of uh, voodoo or something, you know, <laughs> that people are really, uh, transformation starts to show up 
in energetic and, again, direct and concrete ways of how we deal with our own pain and suffering. Mm -hmm. And I, I really feel that that gives me, uh, um, gives me energy to continue to do this work because otherwise transformation is invisible. Mm -hmm. When I was in fourth grade, when we integrated this uh, neighborhood in Jacksonville, Florida, uh, on the north side, uh, Mr. Griffin, who was my teacher in the fourth grade, the first day of class, I raised my hand to answer all the questions, and he just said, Sammy, don't bother raising your hand, you're black. Even if you know the answer, it doesn't matter because you're not going anywhere. And you know, we can talk about the past, but the reality is when we think about Minnesota, we think about the lynchings that happened here, we think about the 38 uh, people who were hanged. Think about all of the people who have been lynched by systemic oppression in the Twin Cities today, yesterday, last week, in this year. We are nowhere near being an open, fair, honest society. So as we think about cultivating transformation, it's important to ask ourselves, how do we begin that journey? So, one of my students um, used to wear a little necklace when she'd come to class every day, and it, and it said, be the change you wish to see in the world, from Gandhi. And I think that one of the things that we have to do is honor that work that Gandhi did when he was in South Africa. Uh, and it came up with the construct of blending the word satya and graha to make truth force or soul force. And what he said is that we have to learn how to be scientists of truth in our own lives. And it's a day-to-day -day process. It's a day-to-day -day practice. If we don't work on constant inner transformation, we can't be a resource for transformation on the planet. And what happens is that we get caught in a role, we get defined in a particular aspect of ourselves, and then we start becoming that aspect. This is a pattern that exists within the global dynamic of global apartheid. We think that apartheid is something that ended in South Africa in 1994, but it didn't end yet. We're still part of that legacy of global apartheid. When the government of South Africa wanted to learn how to create apartheid, they came to the United States. We taught them how to create their homeland system. Ask yourself, what does my ego compel me to do? What do people look to me to do? Is that your ego or is that your soul that people look to? What is it? Often you'll notice that it's your ego. You have set yourself up in an apartheid role. So we, through all of our life's experience, have to heal these three divides. Divide from nature, divide from each other, divide within. I did a workshop back in March for 500 corporate executives, and I asked them, how many of you feel like you can be your full self when you go to work in the morning? There's only one. So even the people who are part of the global 1% are feeling the pain of this apartheid. Even they are feeling it. So we have to heal through this sense that there's an us and a them. We have to get over the luxury of othering and get into the practice of relating. As the indigenous people call it, visiting. Spending time with other people, sharing stories, sharing laughter, sharing crying, sharing whatever it is we have to share in that particular moment and bringing our full self to that space. So, having started with that little introduction, I am Samuel Hugh Grant V. Every Sam Grant has been a community organizer. I have daughters, not sons. My daughters are community organizers. But none of them are named Sam. They have their own names. <laughs> My dream is that this is the generation, this is the moment in history when we shift from this deeper place of relationship and we say, let me take all of this conditioning of apartheid, all of this conditioning of genocide, all of this conditioning of ecocide, all of these are aspects of historical trauma, and let me 
Pull it out of myself in relationship to you. Let me stand with you, sit with you, and circle while you pull it out of yourself, and let us together pull it out of all of our relatives. We have numerous crises that are intersecting right now around how we're relating to the environment. So climate change, climate turbulence, climate, climate chaos, whatever you choose to call it, who is it impacting? If you look at a map of the holocaust of climate change, Minnesota is one of the safest places to be. But that's a great danger for people who are here in Minnesota because that will fortify your complacency. You may not think too much about the people on those island nations. I want you to think about the people on those island nations right this second. We live in a very small world in the internet age. We can connect to people anywhere with internet access and there's still a whole lot of relatives that don't have it. But we can journey to these places that are being most terribly impacted by everything we've created that we're protecting. And I want to say we have an obligation to pay attention at that higher level. Pay attention to the danger, to the risk, to the death that what we have created facilitates and honor how everybody in this room, regardless of your color, regardless of your culture, because here we are in the imperial global north that benefits more than any other place in the world from neoliberalism. And yet, neoliberalism is killing black boys in Minneapolis. So this is the best place, the safest place, and yet it's not equally safe. Does that make sense? So in my own organizing work, I used to believe that organizing was about fighting. Fighting. I lived my life as a clenched fist. My first wife, who has since decided that I wasn't healthy enough yet to be in a relationship and moved on, one day she woke me up because I was screaming in my sleep and my fist was clenched, I was foaming at the mouth, and I was growling. And she gently grabbed my arm first here, and then here, and then here, and just wobbled it, and got me to sit up, and she said, I need to know whatever that is so I can decide if I'm sleeping another night in this bed with you. <laughs> And I was back in the war zone. I was back on my front porch with white boys with loaded guns aiming at me and pulling the triggers. And I was holding a gun and I was shooting back. And she said, you need to heal that. You need to heal that or we can't be here together because that gets in the way of your capacity to love another human being. I'd never thought about it. We, I grew up in the age of you know, revolutionary black nationalism and the American Indian movement for my indigenous brothers here. We used to say, today is a good day to die. If I fade away, let me take 10 of them with me. Right? That's what I grew up with, this kind of military construct. And it was, you know, we worshiped it. We romanced it with our egos. And it was in that moment that I realized that I had to change my definition of what it means to be a warrior in order to be a husband, in order to be a father, in order to be a human being. So I started building relationships with white men, like from a deeper place, no longer from the head, because I used to, you know, the training was, you think about, you know, you have to figure out whether or not they're part of the clan or not before you can take that next step. This was my training. So I just started listening to their stories and saying, let me know you. And as I began to know them, I felt my cells in my body start to shift. That I didn't have to hold this as a way of being anymore. 
I could hold this, this constant process of relating to you, of letting you relate to me from this deeper place, healing together as a fundamental aspect of the journey of the two Leggetts in the midst of all of our other relatives here on Earth. My name is Joe Davis, and I'm here at this conference because I really care about making a difference in the world and bringing people together and dismantling racism, and I want to learn more about tangible ways to accomplish that dream. My name is Sadiq Abdullah. I'm with Brotherhood Inc. Uh, I attended this panel as a, uh, this conference as a panel member, and um, I just thought it was a, a pretty great panel because just hearing like the different, like, ideas from other people and just sharing their experience and me being able to share my experience and like my like personal experience as well and not just what I've read and everything and the people were really receptive and I just think the conference is really great because it's a lot of that going on people sharing different ideas about different issues that's going on and um, this is my second year here and uh, I'm really proud to be here. But coming to this conference today and I'm a proponent of self-power, so I just came here to uh, be more energized, to become more powerful, and to impart that knowledge onto other people, other individuals, that you are some powerful people, and that you can do something from the ground up to make things happen. Because you know something, Margaret Mead said it, that's the only way it does happen when people collectively come together and make change. I, par you know, I paraphrase there, that ain't the, really the quote, but that's what it is. It's about people coming together, using their collective power to make change.
uh, my wife <clears throat> mentioned, my name is uh, Virgil Blacklands, and um, I come from the Lower Sioux area down in Morton, Minnesota, where the, uh, the uh, I guess, the, the place of where my people, the 38 Dakotas, come from. And uh, I guess uh, one of the reasons that, that we're here is because we're given tobacco to, to come and to share some songs with, with everybody. <clears throat> because, you know, like I was mentioning yesterday, uh, we're at a point in our, in our life, in our history, where um, a lot of our interpreters, they tell us that what's up ahead for humanity is uh, it doesn't look good for us. But that uh, through the pipe way of life, through the how we are referred to it as the Chanupa Wakan, the sacred pipe, that there is nothing impossible, that we can change things. I know one of the things my wife and I, we spoke about on numerous occasions was exactly this. How, how do we overcome racism? I remember last year when we were here, I told the people that when I was in the parking lot, I was getting ready to get out of my car and I seen a white woman coming towards me and I locked my door. <laughs> Uh, so I think, you know, we all feel that uh, from time to time. It takes our self-worth away. Whenever I go to a clinic, whenever I go to a hospital, whenever I have to interact, I always am made to be uh, felt like I am not worth it because of the color of my skin. But I've come to understand that we all encounter that. I know in our home, we talk about stereotypes. If we want to begin, my wife and I, my brother, my uncle here, my Dekshi, we can't come here and fix you. We can't come here and fix racism. But we can, we can begin that at home. And one of the things that we do is we recognize our stereotypes. What is your stereotype? What does society dictate your stereotype is for your people? For us, Indians have been tagged as beggars and thieves, alcoholics, drunks. That is our stereotype. And we see that on movies. To get their land, all you have to do is give them something to drink. So in our home, we address that stereotype. 19 years now I've been sober, and it feels good. <laughs> One of my, uh, my oldest child is, uh, well, my oldest daughter, she's 19, getting ready to go into the military service. And to this day, I, I feel proud because my daughter has not seen, has ever seen her father drunk. She's never seen her father uh, get violent in the home. And that's something that uh, we do to address our stereotype. But 
with that being said, you know, the 38 Dakota, the memory of them, our people, um, it's something that's touching for just myself. It's only been five years since one of our people back home, his name is Sheldon Wolfchild, found out that up until only five years ago, it was still legal in the country to scalp an Indian. And that's uh, very disturbing, uh, to say the least, because when we look at our, our history, these uh, things are still happening in our country, not just to us, but for everybody, for all of our people. Whatever background we come from, there is historical trauma that is associated with how we are today. One of the things, one of the things that I think is important is that as we see young people, um, that you might not know it to look at me. I am, um, I am 44 years old, <laughs> and, and I and I have to say I am tired. I am tired of walking into rooms and people saying we are so glad that young people are in this room. <laughs> And they're talking about me, all right? So, so when we see young people taking a step, we uh, you, do you have an album? Yeah. Okay. Where where can I buy your album? Um, Tallpaul612.bandcamp.com. Okay, that's a lot of con. That's a lot of stuff. Yeah. Okay. So. Tallpaul. Look up Tallpaul612 on Google. You'll find all my links. They're all the same. Um, so I'm gonna have to walk back and forth a little bit here to change tracks. But uh, yeah, I was asked to come here and perform. My first song is called. Okay. Um, my first song is called "Peaceful Revolution," and it's a song that I wrote. Like I'm not the most political guy or anything, you know. I'm, I don't pay attention to all the lies and everything, but I write from the I write from the heart. You know what I mean? And uh, this is just about that kind of stuff. So it's playing, and I don't hear no music. Tell you to write. I don't know what to do about the depression and the inflations and that. I'm gonna run that back. I don't want you to protest. I don't want you to ride. I don't so want you to write about, to your congressman you know, because I wouldn't know what to tell you to write. the way we see authority and, that and not really just taking all it at face value like you've they're got all. to get mad. You know, you've got to say, I'm a human being. God damn it! My life has value. Imagine that the same. Imagine that they dumped you in a ditch with your daughter Imagine that for this China troops were all the plotted Imagine those surviving in your family had to watch it Imagine they were labeled insurgents for trying to stop it Imagine they received the same treatment in Delta Darkness Imagine that the leaders of this country couldn't do shit Imagine after all this it was pointless trying to prove shit Imagine having no voice when elections came around Imagine even if you did he'd sell his word and back out Imagine now who the last line I wrote was about I'd imagine you pictured a black president's charming smile imagine being one of them safe secure china citizens watching your leaders put into the deadliest of provisions yet and that lie said you're a domestic terrorist you could be locked for life plus no one will ever know where this is and all the blame for this went straight to the black president no credit given to the faceless camp that is directing him imagine now you didn't have to imagine it i'm forming in u.s soil that's currently happening but our demise is not supplied by slanted eyes it's obviously served by dirty hands on crooked guys if obviously america Became a third world. I'm curious if I dare to fight or watch it unfurl. Get scared and run, I pack some guns and let the bullets burst. I think I'll take the ladder, homie. Family comes first. I never once gave a F about politics. I see that college isn't where their no knowledge lives. And little time ignorant F learned all of this. Fight yourself to study up, pass it on and polish it. So, as I was saying, that song is just about being more. Do I have time to talk in between songs, or should I just rap? Should I just rap? All right. Okay. One more song, that's it? One more song. 
Oh, okay, all right, let me, uh, all right, I'm gonna be, uh, All right. The song's called Present a Song. It's an, uh, a bilingual song in my native language in English. I feel the latent effects of assimilation in a city native Raised by bright lights and skyscrapers Born with dim prospects Little peace and living as a child High headed about the fact I wasn't wild Like they called my ancestors Imagine what it'd be to live nomadic off the land and free Instead I was full of heat like a furnace Cause I wasn't furnished with the language and traditional ways of my peeps Yeah I used to feel like I wasn't truly indigenous Now I say me which get you money do for showing me my true roots Definitely native Take responsibility for being educated My people and customs originating from early phases of history Yes, deeper than fry bread and contest powwows Tears shed in the sweat lodge Prayers go out to all those I've wronged and who have wronged me God Gotta treat them like family. Get your money due. We do Kawashin. Jimushka is he dying? Me Dutch, but me it is he dying? Me just Shanam. I get away when Ganu just Shanam. Isn't there with Shanam? Me Wayne just nugga mo yam. Need me show me we do Kawashinam. Just our budget too young. Ganish Shanam baby is just twirling. Me just big. You came to mind K Y. Ganish Shanam baby my dizzy win. Becoming aware of our heartbeats fragility. So I. Pray for my creator's will and humility It seems my prayer's weak, I can't speak Not a linguist Does he hear my English when I vent? I feel the answer to the question This is symbolic of anguish I feel regarded language and the obligation Of revitalizing something sacred Failure to carry through is disgrace in a nation My first tongue's in need of a facelift But deciphering conjugations Like trying to find my way through a maze in the matrix Complex, hard to start without an end Aside from being fluent I Gotta push the limit if I'm gonna keep pursuing. So I use it in a way that relates to my life and vocab. Bring some entertainment to it, spit it on the track. And I take it out the class. Can't let what I lack become a self-defeating habit that'll make me wanna quit. Get your money due, we do Kawashin. Jimushka is he down? Me Dutch, but me it is he down? Me just Shanam, I get away when Ganu just Shanam. Bissin down with Shanam, me Wayne just nugga mo yam. Need me show me we do Kawashinam. Shit, I budget too down. Ganish Shanam, baby, is you twirling? Me just bit, you came to mind. K Y, this Shanam, baby, my dizzy went. So that song's called Prayers and a Song. You can find it on YouTube. Being in education, going into education, I feel like this experience is going to really help me to think about how I'm going to incorporate some of these things that I've learned into, you know, teaching youth and into creating acceptance and understanding amongst different races and different groups of students to be able to you know, have different um, different age groups and different students that go into the world, you know, within their respective careers to um, have respect for one another. So I enjoyed this conference a lot and it has taught me a great deal. So I live in the Dayton's Bluff neighborhood, which is 40% white, 25% Asian, 15% Hispanic, and 15% um, black, mostly Afri black, mostly African American. Um, and so 20 years ago, it was 80% white. It's a neighborhood that's had a lot of change. Uh, most of the big businesses have moved out. Whirlpool's gone, 3M's gone, the brewery's gone. Um, and so now we've got uh, new Mexican markets growing and uh, small businesses coming from all of those immigrant communities coming up. So the neighborhood actually is kind of coming to grips with that. Um, uh, the neighborhood organization, the D Dayton's Bluff District Council is a pretty progressive neighborhood organization forward thinking and realizes that the strength in the neighborhood is everybody working together. Um, so uh, there's, there's an equity committee that I'm part of um, and I'm really happy that the organization is doing that work. It's not always easy. Um, not everybody wants to live in the 21st century. Some people would like to go back to 1950 but can't do it. In order to make a change, we need to first acknowledge that racism is in our front yard and our backyard. And it's not ever really gonna stop if we keep having this attitude that, oh, 
we don't need to do yard work. There's some leaves, but we don't need to rake them. And so, no, not unless people start acknowledging that it at least exists. So I don't go around saying, hey, Maikau, Asian person, Hmong, you know, ethnic, whatever. And then something says something, some, some people, you know, they just forget and they, they do stuff and then it, it makes me remember. So I started getting really curious about white people, right? And here I am and I decided, I changed jobs, I went to Wilder. And I thought, you know, I'll just do this doctorate in public administration at Hamlin University so I can figure out what the heck's going on. <laughs> um, because uh, I was really curious, you know, why are we always studying racism from the perspective of people of color? I mean, aren't there more white people in the world who are in leadership positions? <laughs> so after a couple of years of wandering around on, on my uh, proposals, those of you who have PhDs, you know what I'm talking about. The research question is so hard to come up with, at least it was for me. And I was trying to do this, working full time at Wilder as a new CEO, four kids, and going to graduate school. <sighs> But I finally landed on a great topic, which I was highly curious about. So I, I focused uh, my dissertation on white people in government who are actually working to represent racial minorities. Like, how are they actually doing it? You know, what are the personal and organizational factors that contribute to that? Um, because uh, I knew what was contributing to myself to kind of move things along, but I had no idea why are these white people doing this? Um, and, um, you know, we assume it's true that, you know, if you're, at black, you're representing maybe people who are black and you have that, you know, view of the world, but, you know, uh, is, what does it really say? What does the research really say? Well, you know, the research says that that is actually, in fact, true for those of you who are curious about that, but no studies of any kind on white people in government. Mine was the first of its kind. Can you believe that? Yeah. I had to draw from the fields of sociology, psychology, political science, you know, to study public administration, which is a huge, huge powerful force in our society, right? So why study race and representation in the perspective of white people? I'm moving into the second segment here, which is really about my studies. So in public service, we have this ethic, and you know, if you're working in nonprofit, the nonprofit sector, you, you, know, you have this ethic as well. There's really an ethic of service. Um, in public administration that says, we are here to represent all and serve all people, um, and to make sure that all are included. Um, this ethic of race to achieve social equity uh, is really, really challenging, right? Um, because of our, our centuries of oppression, slavery, colonialism, war, and white racial framing. Um, racial disparities persist across sector and public efforts are underway, but, Oftentimes, it's those public institutions that need to change. They need to inform themselves, and we keep trying to say, well, can you please, people of color out here, kind of inform us? And it's like, no, you're the ones that need to change, all right? Um, the study was really unique because it, it was really looking at white allies, um, and uh, you know, people of color over the centuries have not been alone in making the progress that's been made. Partly, it's been because we've had very little power in an authoritative sense to actually make changes. So what do we know from the research about being white? Um, we all know that race is socially constructed, there's no biological basis, and that race forms in relation to others, reinforced because we socialize inside of our racial group, and then we get kicked out of other racial groups, right? We're assigned a, a social value. Um, and actually, when you get out too far, then people actually push you back in again. Um, so if you get too successful as a person of color or, you know, you get uh, too oriented towards understanding as a white person, the experience of people of color, your own group actually tosses you out. You know, that's a really hard thing. Um, so it can work against you. Your own group can work against you because they also define those boundaries. Um, and because society, because of, of how we have socialized people, actually assigns value to a person and it follows them throughout society in jobs, in community organizing, in academia. Um, well, we have wealth inequality, right? Being white is also being about the norm. You know, the norm was created by white people who are in power, nothing against white people today. Use your privilege as a tool and a weapon for good, those of you who are white. Um, it's, it's just there. We can't even identify it anymore. Now, what are the characteristics of whiteness? This was interesting. 
social dynamics that create structural advantages without us needing to think about it. A lot of white people who are anti-racist allies actually reject their whiteness because they feel like they did nothing to earn it. And I hate to tell you guys this, white people, but I know you didn't do anything. <laughs> That's what racism is. <laughs> <laughs> okay, like I reject my Asianness too. Like I actually think of myself as Hmong, all right? But you know, society kind of tells me I'm Asian and they treat me that way and there's nothing I can do about it. So it's all very frustrating for all of us in society. But I want you to know that I finally get it after these studies that white people also don't like it and it's okay, you don't have to. Um, being white, the characteristics of whiteness is that uh, you are unmarked and invisible, which means there's color blindness, arguments around color blindness, it's totally un not conscious, and um, a lot of times people who are white say, well, I don't have a culture. Yeah, you do. Um, everybody has a culture. Understanding it, making it visible is actually the first step to gaining consciousness. Whiteness also resists uh, uh, challenges. So actually, whiteness asserts itself when it is the most challenged. And by the way, that's true for people of color, too. But I was studying white people, so I'm talking about white people. Um, <laughs> You know, the, the myth of meritocracy it reinforces white superiority, manifest destiny given to us by God, individual action got me here, all these different things. When in fact there were a lot of federal, uh, local, and, and state policies that actually, and private actions that reinforce those things. And um, white identity can be positive or negative. In other words, you can be a really a white person who has a strong white identity who's an anti-racist ally, and you can be a strong, a, a white person who has a really strong identity to be fascist and to believe that you are the most superior race. Kind of scary, actually, I, when I found that out. You know, one of the things in, in looking through the research was that actually the more educated a white person is, um, the, more, um, the, more like, the less likely they are to actually think about race or to actually think about racial equity at all. So you'd think that that would be the opposite, right? That the most educated of us who are white would actually be, uh, because of our big brains and our ability to gain consciousness, that, that we would actually do better. But it turns out that's not true. Low-income whites and middle-class whites are actually a lot more racially conscious and care about it than upper-income whites. So in anti-racism work, which is a lot of what you guys do, um, exposure of, of white people to people of color is supposed to like raise consciousness, right? Uh, and move towards the creation of a non-racist world. Huh, turns out that's not so true. Because exposure doesn't mean engagement and belief doesn't mean action. Uh, Minnesota is a great teacher of apartheid. This is the best place to live in the world and it's the worst place to live in the world. All of my friends who are organizers in the black world, we talk about the Black Misery Index. How are you doing in your engagements and interrogations of white space in white Asota? How is, how's it going for you? How's it going for you? Now, I know that might be a little painful to hear, but I mean, I'm being really nice and gentle today. <laughs> this is the good, nice me. I haven't, have I, I don't think I've sworn yet, have I? <laughs> I? I normally do a lot of that. I've even thrown chairs across the classroom to help make a, you know, an important pedagogical point. <laughs> so we have a lot of healing to do. And I was about to tell a story and I forgot what it was. Black Misery Index among black organizers. So, look at the employment disparities. We have the worst unemployment disparity for black people here in Minnesota of all major metro areas. Now, the, uh, the raw unemployment rate is worse in some other cities, but the ratio, I mean, the relative disparity of White unemployment to black unemployment is worse here than anywhere else. So even though the oppression index is high for all people, it's particularly high and persistent for American Indians and African Americans here in Minnesota. So you look at child uh, out-of-home placement, you look at the criminal justice system, you look at health disparities, you look at employment disparities, housing disparities, particularly ugly 
and painful on a daily basis for indigenous people and black people. I'm not sure about the numbers. We have to do a lot of work on healing our relationship with data and building powerful, compelling, appropriate, accurate data with each other. But I just looked at a study that said that in order to end the employment disparity for African Americans and American Indians by 2020, we have to create 83,000 additional jobs specifically for blacks and Indians by 2020 in the Twin Cities metro area. 83,000 additional jobs specifically for blacks and Indians. So think about everybody in the room right now. And let's imagine everybody in the room is on Facebook or LinkedIn or something like that, and you've got a thousand friends. If you called all a thousand of your friends and those with the wherewithal to hire, if they all made the decision to hire an African American or an American Indian, you referred to them today, could we solve that problem today? Could we? You know, I mean, Naid is right. Maybe we could. Part of why the severe oppression continues is that we lack the awareness, the imagination, and the courage to act from our most powerful self today. So the journey of transformation begins with you being the bigger you. So Marianne Williamson wrote this great poem that people wrongly attributed to Nelson Mandela as his inaugural speech. And I'm going to paraphrase it because I don't have a good memory. But at the core, she says, the world needs the biggest you to show up in every instant. We can't afford the small you, and neither can you. What does it take for you to be the biggest you? Which is the same thing that Gandhi talked about with Satyagraha. Be your highest self and engage me from there. Because when you engage me from there, it inevitably, because of its energy, gets me to show up from a higher place. 